Good morning and happy Sabbath. We're going to invite you guys to join in singing some hymns with us today. We're going to open with hymn 442. The words are going to be up here, but if you'd like to sing parts or follow along in your hymnal, 442, How Sweet Are the Tidings. And we'll do all verses. Next one is number 327, I'd Rather Have Jesus. i 
opening song if you guys would stand with us for this one please this is come thou fount of every blessing
Amen, amen. And as you pause in the seats for just a moment, I now invite you to kneel with me as we pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be worshiping you on this Sabbath day. We thank you for the chance we have to do that here. Father, I know some people are unable to make it physically, and I'm thankful they're able to watch online and to enjoy this service of worship. Please bless them as well. Those that are traveling, we know some are out of state. We know some are camping this weekend here in state, and we ask your blessing on our friends and relatives and, and family, wherever they might be. We praise you for the gifts you've given us. We praise you for spring that is just about here. We thank you for, uh, for the warmth that is coming, and we just praise you for all the things you've done for this church. In your name we pray. Amen. So the children have a special time in our service now, and I invite the kids to come forward if they would like to hear a special story. They can collect an offering, which will go to further the work in the gymnasium if they would like. And Miss Laura has a story for you today. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm going to tell you a story this morning, and the title of the story is A Friendly Disagreement. This story, if you had to guess, would probably be a story about Mr. Stacy and birds. And if you guessed that, you're actually right. But as a bonus, we get a mission trip story as well. Now, you're going to hear about the Dominican public mission trip later. That's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about a different trip with Mr. Stacy. So Mr. Stacy and I went to a mission trip in Panama. Panama is a country in Central America. And the place we went in Panama is called Changinola. It is in the northwest part of Panama. And when Mr. Stacy and I went on this trip, we made sure we had our binoculars. Do you see the straps? We don't see the binoculars, but you see the straps for me and Mr. Stacy. Well, this part of the country had beautiful trees. It was a rainforest. It had water and marshes and just beautiful um, monkeys in the trees. There were toucans flying around. It was a beautiful part of Panama. Well, when we go on this mission trip, it's a Maranatha Volunteers International mission trip, and our purpose was to build a church. Well, we got to the job site, and this might sound funny to talk about, but whenever you have a job site, you need to have a place to go to the bathroom, right? So some places have a building with flush toilets. We like those. Sometimes there's an outhouse. Sometimes there's a porta potty. But in this place in Panama, this is, well, I don't have a picture of what we had, but what we had for a bathroom place was just over the hill from the job site where we were making the church, and the workers dug a hole, and they put a tarp around it like a tent, and that was the bathroom. 
But the best part about that bathroom, it was by even more marshy than the picture that you show here. There was a beautiful marsh with lily pads and green grass and green plants. And the best part about that is there were birds there. So we were excited. And every time we took a break from putting blocks on the con putting concrete blocks down, we would tell each other we're taking a bird watching break instead of a bathroom break. So Mr. Stacy, took a bird watching break, and he went and he saw a bird, but he didn't see it this well. There was a, t he said, he told me when he told me about the bird that it was a darker bird with long legs. And it was hidden behind a branch and he couldn't see the whole bird, but he said, I think it's a northern Hassana. So that's a bird. So I said, I'm going to take a bird watching break. And I went to look, and I saw a bird that had long legs. And it was dark, but I couldn't see all of the bird either. And that's where our friendly disagreement started. OK, so I said, I saw a bird with yellow legs. And they were really bright yellow. And Mr. Stacy said, I saw a bird, but I didn't see his legs as well. But it looked like it had a. Uh, a uh, yellow on its beak, but I couldn't see the whole bird. So next time I took my bird watching break, I said, no, but I think I saw one with bright yellow legs, and I think I saw one that had maybe some color on its back and some orange and yellow. So we had a friendly disagreement because I thought it was what was called a purple gallinule. So Mr. Stacy said, I think it's a northern Hassana, and I said, I think it's a purple gallinule. Well, Mr. Stacy and I had a friendly disagreement. We didn't fight. We didn't yell at each other. It wasn't an argument. We were very friendly. Well, one day when Mr. Stacy took his bird watching break, he took his binoculars and he walked out to the marsh and he looked out and he saw, guess what he saw? Two birds all out in the open, and you know what they were? They were a purple gallinul and a northern Hassana. They kind of look alike, and if they're hiding behind the bushes, it's hard to tell them apart. But you know what was the result of our friendly disagreement? We were both right. We like to be right, don't we? Well, that, teach, that taught me something about sometimes some things we might have friendly disagreements about at church. So I can think of a friendly disagreement about Sabbath afternoon. Some people think you should take a nap on Sabbath afternoon, and some people think you should go hiking. Well, the best part about Alaska in the summertime is you're both right. You could take a nap and then take two hikes because the days are so long. Isn't that great? You're both right. Well, some people um, at church think we should sing hymns from the hymnal for our praise time. And some people like to sing songs that come from the radio station that you hear current songs. And guess what? As long as you are singing songs that praise God, you can both be right. There are people who think perhaps that the best Bible to learn from is a King James Version. And there's some people who like the Living Bible. But you can both be right if you're reading and learning the truth about Jesus. Also, people when they come to church might wear different clothes. Sometimes people wear a nice dress and a suit and a tie. Sometimes they wear t-shirts with the mission shirt rip, but sometimes they wear jeans with holes in them and a stained Carhartt jacket. And what do you think? Do you think they're both right? The people who wear the fancy dresses and the people in the stained Carhartt jacket, they are both right. So that taught me that if you have a friendly disagreement, and you might have a disagreement with your brother or your sister, or your friends, or the older generation here might have a disagreement with your spouse, or with your parents, or with another church member. I would like you just to consider that when you have that friendly disagreement, it is just possible 
that you both might be right. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you first that we can learn about you from nature, second, that we can learn about you on mission trips, and third, that we're always right when we worship and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and go to your seats. It's a skill to have a friendly disagreement sometimes, isn't it? That's fun. Hey, our church has got a lot going on. We're missing a few people in church today, and I just wanted to let you know that our pastor and some of the younger generation are actually camping this weekend, doing a little bit of exploring Jim Creek area and and, and experiencing spring. And so we're with snow, yes, indeed. We're, uh, We're happy for them, and we ask that God blesses their Sabbath as well. Our school, the seniors just got back from um, U days, university days. Back when I was there, it was college days. But now we went to Walla Walla University and spent a few days with uh, our four seniors from Amazing Grace Academy. And let me tell you, Amazing Grace and Palmer was represented well. They were represented well. 350 kids, we took four of them. During the awards portion, Amazing Grace Academy was mentioned several times. So... So yeah, we've got some really good kids, and we had a wonderful time after that. We went up to Spokane and Coeur d'Alene for their senior trip, and Miss Carlton and I got to chaperone that, and that was fun because usually senior trips are Disneyland or some big city place. We went hiking. Well, let's say the kids went hiking. Miss Carlton and I did our best. Um, my legs are sore, but we had a great time in nature and really enjoyed a, a, an awesome opportunity to just visit with our four seniors. I hope you'll Continue to pray for them and continue to pray for our school as we wrap up the school year and then support all of our kids uh, when graduation comes around next month. Um, A few announcements really quick. Dr. Oliver had some information he wanted to share with us. This is a cool time of year. We see spring happening here. And there's events happening around the world. And what can you tell us about some things that might be interesting? So Passover will be... Uh, the, the day of Passover begins at sundown the 22nd and goes to sundown the 23rd, when the be- which is the beginning of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So I've been talking about having a Passover, uh, having a Passover meal, and we will be doing that on the 23rd of, of this month, and we plan to start about 5.30, and I'm... Tr- I'm planning to try to do this in such a way several several parents with young children have told me that they're interested in coming so and it's also a school night so I would like to try to get this do this so that it's not something that takes very long you know 5 30 and hopefully be done even by seven o'clock and so if you're interested in helping out with this um, please uh, let me know and we'll we'll try to see if we can get this all organized for next week thank you it's going to be here at the church, <laughs> and the meal will be in the fellowship hall. Very good. And since he mentioned fellowship hall and meal, there is a fellowship meal today, and my understanding is there is a lot of food. So if you are visiting, please stay and join us. If you're not visiting, stay and join us as well, and we would love to have a fellowship meal with you after the service today. Our eighth graders have some information they want to share, too. So there's several things on our calendar coming up, and one is the church business meeting tomorrow night. And, um, yeah, what do you guys have going on that you would like to tell us about? So tomorrow, the eighth graders are putting on a, a fundraiser for our graduation. We're going to be serving haystacks and tacos. It's going to be from 4.15 to 5 o'clock, so right before the business meeting. Um, Bring, please bring donations so we can have a good graduation. Eighth grade fundraiser with food, it's always a good thing. So yeah, 4.15 to 5 o'clock tomorrow, come on out and then stay for the business meeting right after that. 
Um, as our deacons come forward, our offering this morning is for the Hope Channel International. If you're familiar with Hope Channel, it's a relatively new-ish, and I can say that because I'm relatively older-ish, um, program. It started in 2003. Did you realize that? Hope Channel started in 2003 in North America with one channel. Now it's looking at 80 channels in 80 languages in 150 countries spreading the message of hope. And so today's offering goes to support Hope Channel International. Let's bow our heads as we pray over that. Father in heaven, we're concentrating on missions and thinking outside of ourselves today, and so our offering is for a similar mission. It's for spreading the word through Hope Channel of your soon coming. And I ask that you will bless what we're able to give today, and we ask your blessing on this ministry as well as it reaches people in far parts of the world for you. In your name we pray. Amen. The Bible is full of scripture that talks about helping others, going out to greet others, to tell others of uh, Jesus and of his soon coming. And Isaiah talks about that in scripture, and Bonnie's going to read the scripture this morning. Our scripture this morning is Isaiah 6, verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. The uh, sermon time is going to be a little different this week. We're going to be talking about our recent trip to the Dominican Republic, and I have some friends that are going to help me up here on, on the platform. Uh, for those of you that were on the mission trip that um, didn't get notified about this, Verlin, come on up. Um, I'm not going to call on any of you to do anything that would embarrass you. Um, however, I would like those that uh, participated in this year's mission trip to the Dominican Republic to go ahead and stand, just so people can see who you are. Yeah, that's the worst that's gonna happen to you today. There are a few more, thank you. We had 21 people all together that went on this trip. And um, we have um, about half of them here today, probably. And um, so, And we went to the Dominican Republic. Let me give you a little bit of background about this trip. First of all, we started doing mission trips here, foreign mission trips here, 
from AGA in 12 years ago. What was that? 2012. And we went to the Dominican Republic. And we went to um, Santo Domingo and built a church there and had a good time. And it was hot. And it was wonderful people and lovely beaches and all sorts of things. And uh, since then, we've gone to Help me out here. Panama, Bolivia, um, Peru. Peru. And we were supposed to go to Peru again. And um, COVID kind of put so many restrictions on it that we canceled the trip. So then last year, we were going to go to Peru again. And one week before we left, the airport where we were going to go to in Juliaca was closed down due to civil unrest. So this year we said, let's go somewhere where we might have a better chance of, of actually doing the mission trip. So we went to the Dominican Republic. Stacy, where did we go? We went to a small community called La Caleta 6, which is uh, several miles east of the big city of Santo Domingo. Anything more about that? Do you have any any, any history of La Caleta? Yeah, so it was, it was fun. A couple of Christmases ago, Laura and I led a trip um, to La Caleta 5, and th which is a community nearby, and we built a church there. So there's a lot of little communities. We'll talk a little more about that later with the churches from La Caleta, but it's a neat region to be from. We got to stay in Eden. Well, not, not that Eden, but this is a, a slide of where we stayed. It's called El Eden. It's a how would you describe what it is, Ashley? Maybe before we do that, do you think we could lower these lights so we can see the presentation a little better? So um, this is kind of a complex that we were able to stay in, and the building that you see in the picture looks like a dorm. So um, that building uh, had all the bedrooms in it, and then alongside in the grounds, there was a basketball court that the kids lived to play in. And there's a few more pictures about the, the facility. So it, it's a little bit hard, but this is kind of like a covered palapa area. We had um, a kitchen, a big meeting place, so we pretty much lived in this space. And of course, a pool, which the kids lived in. <laughs> yeah, after we worked, we were, had a chance to cool off. The, the young one there is our pastor's son, whose name escapes me right now. Jorge. 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 I should have known that. He's George. a bundle of energy. A bundle of energy. Bundle of energy. Um, is all we could do to keep him from drowning. I don't know what this picture is. Okay, so um, baseball is really popular in the Dominican Republic, and there are several training facilities that you can be that you can go to on the island. And I don't know if anyone's a baseball fan here and is into that. Um, my father-in-law is really into baseball, so this was uh, our boundary. So this is the Cincinnati Reds training facility. It was right next door to our facility, so I'm taking a picture through the fence so I can say, look, there's a baseball place here. So there were several of those all over the DR, so it was pretty cool. So we got to the job site, and this is where we were going to be working. Uh, it doesn't look like much right there. You can see a little bit of the, the roof with a tarp. Well, it's the tarped roof, and you can see that there are no walls. Behind all these uh, people that are standing there getting ready to go, you can see one row, one little tiny row of blocks. Looks very lonely. Um, we were going to be doing two major things. We're going to be building the walls for this facility. And Verlin, what else were we going to be doing? We also led out in a VBS. Right next door to the job site was a local government school. K to sixth grade, and we had the privilege of doing the VBS at the school. It was a unique experience. <laughs> Ashley and Cora also were leaders with me, and it was amazing. First of all, it was amazing. Every day I walked to the school and I'm thinking, we are walking into a public school. And for the next hour and a half, we're going to get to sing songs and praise God. And I just, I don't know why I got such a kick out of that. That was just a really awesome thing. Um, and then we uh, 
did the VBS, so they assigned us two or three classrooms every day. And so we would take over the class for about half an hour. We had about half an hour per class. So uh, that, at first that was kind of the challenge, is how to condense a VBS program into about an hour and a half. But um, it was a joy. It was just a lot of fun. Our young people really came out of their shell and just, I was a joy to see them interacting with the kids. And do we have any pictures of the VBS? So we do have some pictures okay. later in the slideshow. But I would say we would come back every day and be constantly amazed that we were doing what we did with like eight people. Yes. So you'll get to see a few more slides about what we did, yes. but we, it was intense, it but it was, was intense, it was a blessing. Yeah. So usually most days we would split up, um, each of the three adults would take a classroom with two or three young people. And then we did have the privilege of having two translators as well. Um, wonderful young people that came out every day and helped translate, as well as the kids, the, the little kids, many of them were wanting to practice their English, and so that was fun. We got to share um, about the fruit of the spirit, that was a lot of fun, but then we also uh, chose to share about Alaska, so uh, there was a lot of fun things in Ashley's class. She got to... Uh, they really didn't know what a muskox was, which yeah. was pretty exciting. Um, I, I, we all know what a polar bear is in Spanish. It's oso polar, so I got that. Um, but it was really fun trying to describe some of these crazy Alaskan animals yeah. to children that are not from that uh, environment. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. And I, I want to add, I don't think you realize how hard it is to communicate to someone when it's not your native language and to also think of um, how can I say something that is going to be translated. So you'll see this later, but Verlin did a lot of translating, and I just spoke really slowly <laughs> and then paused. So uh, that's not some of our normal culture, so just keep that in the back of your head. You don't have to translate things, so that was yeah. a challenge. Yeah. How many kids did you guys end up seeing through the course of the week? So in this little school, um, on their uh, register that they gave to us, were 416 children. And so we were in all the classrooms uh, throughout the week. So we, we might talk about that later, because we have some good pictures that we can talk on a little bit later yes. on, on the joys that, that we got to experience. Yeah. One, one thing that Verlin didn't mention was that um, this was a public school, but they wanted to approve the curriculum ahead of time. They did, yeah. So an interesting thing, if you look at the Dominican flag, the, the Dominican Republic flag, right in the center of it, does anybody know what's in the center of it? Did you look at it? Laura Somebody knows. who wasn't on the trip, did you pay attention to their flag? It's the only flag in the world that has that. Somebody shout it out. They have a Bible. They have La Santa Biblia, and it says it right there. It's got a Bible. And um, so they are a very religious nation, a very religious culture, and they wanted to make sure that we were bringing solid Bible teaching. So I had to have the curriculum put together and submitted a little summary of what we were doing, and, and they approved it, and at the end they approved of of what we did, so that was that was awesome as well. Okay, here's Stacy giving some uh, instruction uh, on our first work day, and notice, I want you to notice as we go through the slides, the progression of the walls. Okay, that's gonna be important, the progression of the walls. There's me uh, doing supervisory work, day one. There was a lot of prep to doing this. A lot of sand and gravel had to be shoveled, a lot of blocks had to be moved, um, a lot of, um, just a lot of work every day to get stuff done. And here we are on the first day, the Friday that we were there, we got in early Thursday morning and, and just used Thursday to um, catch up after two nights of travel. And um, so Friday we went to the job site and we started working. And we had good workers. We had 21 people total, 11 women, 10 men. It's the smallest mission trip I've taken abroad and probably the hardest working. Yeah, certainly one of the most abroad. efficient ones I think I've experienced as well. It was a great, great group. 
Uh, Ashley mentioned coming back after VBS, and uh, one of the, the, like the first day after VBS on Monday, um, the girls came back. I don't know about the boys, I wasn't paying attention to them. The girls came back, changed their clothes, and went back to work for the last hour. They didn't have to, but they chose to. That was the kind of group we had with us um, this year. Uh, and end of the day, you can see that we had some more block than at the beginning of the day, and uh, it was still sunny. And you can see instead of one row of blocks, what are there, like three? So not bad for a first day. Yeah, we put up three, there were four total, which is really kind of fascinating, and, and it's a learning experience too. If you've never laid block before, it takes a little bit to figure it out, right? And even if you have laid block before, it takes a little bit to get back into the swing of it because not many of us do it for a living at all. Um, but we had a group that just learned really quick, jumped right in, and didn't give up. And yeah, the progress was, was fun to see. I think the majority of us have never done it before. So when Stacy gave his presentation, it's like, we're all new. We have no clue how to do this. And I think we figured it out. Um, this picture, it's hard for us to see because it's so far away. Um, so this is the Ralston family, and they just work together. They work together on the front of the church, and they pretty much built that front wall on their own. And then when they were done, they worked on the wall that they're sitting on right now. So they were a force to be reckoned with. And, uh, you know, uh, Rob Carlison and I would kind of glance over from the other side to see how far they were going, because, you know, there's some healthy competition trying to build the church walls. Friendly agreements. Friendly, agreements. friendly yes. motivation. Of the, of the 21 people who went on this trip, eight were repeats from previous mission trips here from AGA. And, and that, that helped quite a bit. We had, we had good teachers, George and Stacy and, and um, uh, Curtis, and uh, all of them knew what, what they were doing and how to do it. Mike and Jordan. And, and, uh, and who? Mike and yeah, Jordan. Mike oh, yeah, and Jordan. Mike, and well, yeah, we had eight, eight all together. I didn't name all of them. I was talking about the good teachers here. Yeah, anyway. Well, they worked as well. It was a good teacher, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the first Sabbath that we were there, we had the opportunity to, to uh, uh, present part of the program. We sang, we preached. We, um, we had a good time that first Sabbath, but you can see that the walls aren't very high, but they wanted to meet in their new church. Where they had been meeting before was in the backyard of one of the church members. Not an ideal situation. Yeah, and that I guess was in good weather. If it was inclement weather, they had a garage they could meet in with roll-up doors, and it would have not been a very pleasant yeah. place, so they were excited to come worship here with us. We got a surprise the first Sabbath. Verlin, you want to talk about this or not? They just have this beautiful gratitude, you know? That was a beautiful thing that uh, I love to experience again, and I was so glad that our young people got to see how they just have this gratitude. And so they wanted to share with us how grateful they were that we were there. And they're wearing their native clothing with the flag, and they just had a little song and a presentation that they did for us. It was so cute and so beautiful. And they learned some of it and sang it in English as well, yeah. which was classic. Yes, I loved it. Yes, that is true. And, and what flags do you see up there? The Alaska. I know, I can't. We have to kind of look at this one. They have a, yeah, the Alaska flag. They, they took their time and, and decorated an Alaska flag and Alaska banner for us just to welcome us. It was really fun. Yeah, this church, I was really impressed with this group. Their thoughtfulness was just really incredible and the young lady you see there on the left she was one of our translators and one of the leaders in the church so um yeah real i don't know if you can go back <laughs> real quick yeah, i think so um so rick did the sermon and verlin translated and then the next picture is of she kind of is serving as a lay pastor okay her name is leo and what was really striking about Leo is what she's doing right now is she is talking to the congregation and she's saying, this is your church. These people are coming here to help us build, but this is your church and we want you here too to come help on the job site, get your hard hats and you come help. And I mean, she's a very loud, direct person and she's saying, hey, 
we're part of the family, you need to come help. And, and she was always on the job site giving us ice because it was hot, us Alaskans were hot, and uh, giving us chocolates. So, um, yeah, quite the motivational speaker, wasn't she? <laughs> yeah, and I thought you had said that that wasn't necessarily the norm on a job site, but yeah. maybe I'm wrong. O often it's tough to get the, lo well, th the locals have to commit either money and or time to that church in order to have Maranatha become part of it. And so they're vested in their church, which is very true, but to see a leader like this mm -hmm. encourage her congregation the way she did was, uh, was unique in my experience and really rather enjoyable. It was fun to see. And I think we even had one of the members who was in his 80s oh, who was yeah. pushing wheelbarrows and lifting up cement blocks, and he was very active for Never most feel of the time. like you're too dad. old. That was her dad. Oh, was it? Oh, that's classic. Yeah, yeah you're not too old. he came, and he was working right alongside her. So this picture, um, we're doing song service in English, but if you can make it out, this is probably a two-year-old, and I kid you not, he is getting down Front and as center. we are singing. <laughs> so um, it is everything spirit. I can do to keep a straight face and try to sing because he, he's feeling the joy of the Lord right now, and he was doing literally this dance up front, and so um, we were all really just trying to sing. <laughs> Uh, the first Sabbath afternoon, after we had uh, church and lunch, we drove north about an hour to the Cave of Wonders, is what it was called. Stacy, you've been there a bunch. Yeah, this is a massive cave system um, east of Santa Domingo. I guess it was discovered in 1926. It's about 80 feet deep. It's about a half mile long, and it covers an area of about 1.7 square miles. It is a massive cave system, and they've developed it. Um, and you can see st stalactites and stalagmites and, and all sorts of pools underwater, and they have a light system through only about 30% of it. So 70% of this massive cave is native. It's, it's wild. You can't see it. It goes back into the, back into the hillside. But it's, it's really fun to walk down there. It's cooler. Uh, you can see some amazing sights. It's well done with a tour leader, and it's lit walkways, and really a neat place. Yeah, it's about 135 steps down, and, and everything down there is paved. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine hauling the stuff down there to, to build the, the sidewalks. Yeah. And outside is an iguana sanctuary. Um, everything from lizard size to big enough to take your arm, except they're vegetarians. Um, and uh, they, they have this sanctuary there because they were hunted almost to extinction through the country for food. And uh, so they have this iguana sanctuary. And iguanas do escape from there and go out into the wild again. Okay, we're back at work again on Sunday and Monday. And you can see that the uh, walls are coming up. And you can see that uh, people are working hard. Oh, are they pouring bond beans? Yeah, every, every few rounds of block, you have to fill it up with, uh, with concrete. These buildings are over-engineered. They want them to withstand hurricanes. They want them to withstand earthquakes. They want them to be a center in the community for the people that they're serving. Not, not just the church people, but the community at large. And so the, the buildings are are built very strongly, structurally they're sound. And you can see that a lot of people working, a lot of people doing this, and you can see they're diligent at, at what they're doing. And uh, it, just, it just went on day after day. I, oh, oh, and at lunchtime, we had, I don't remember the, the cook's name, it's a lady, a local lady, an Adventist lady who owns her own restaurant, and she, I hesitate to use the word catered, but that's probably the best word. She catered our meals for us. Breakfast and suppers at uh, where we were staying and lunch at the job site. And they were hot meals, every one of them. It wasn't like, like uh, sandwiches and chips. It was, uh, it was hot meals and uh, a lot of local foods. Okra. Oh, Laura just texted me. <laughs> Akanya was her name. Akanya. Ikanya. Yeah, yeah Ikanya. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, neat, neat lady, uh, yeah. fascinating. Um, she she cooked for us in Christmas time. The same yeah. trip we were there. O okra, eggplant, yucca, 
Um, what else did we have? Platano. Oh, plantano. Oh, yes, plantano. Uh, plantains. Mangu. Uh, f- uh, mashed up and made Empanada. into mangu and fresh fruit almost every meal. She even found um, some barely ripe mangoes for us because they weren't in season. Uh, but the food was, was just exceptional. And uh, Becky, you, you would have liked it because you wouldn't have had to cook it. <laughs> it, was, it was very well done. And, and I noticed that the kids, which kind of surprised me, maybe it shouldn't have, were even trying some of the things that they didn't know what it was. And uh, it, was, it was a good experience. Here we are back at work, working hard. And you can see the walls are now chest high, depending on how tall you are. Chest I think high. I want to point out that, and when you look at photos, you cannot, you can't feel, you can see, you cannot feel how hot the sun is on us, and you can't smell anything. And um, Rob is working on a side that is in full direct sunlight the entire day. So we were always keeping our eye on him so he wouldn't fall over. And he did it all week long. He would choose the hardest side. He would choose the hardest side. So um, Laura made sure that we were all being hydrated. That was something that was very important. And again, we're not acclimated to that temperature, so it's intense. And uh, as the week went on, I would deliberately place myself in a place where the sun wasn't hitting me right in the morning. Because when you feel the sun, it really does start to take a lot of energy from you and you just slow down. You just, ugh, even though you are wearing protective layers and sunscreen and Rob has a bandana that covers his neck. So um, I think as a team, we were all very conscious of making sure we slowed down, drank a lot of water, stayed out of the sun, took a break. And then, like I said, Leo, our friend, would bring us ice. And she goes, put it on your head. Put it under your hat. Put it on your head. It, it, you guys, it'll cool you down. I'm like, OK. So we had ice dripping off our heads. <laughs> One of the advantages of having so many um, veterans on a trip like this is, is we can share our accrued knowledge with everyone else. And we, we did, like Ashley said, we did hammer home. Drink, drink. Even if you think you've drunk enough water, you haven't and people stayed hydrated. We had, what was the worst injury we had, Laura? A splinter that you had to take out? Yeah. Uh, so no, no major injuries, no major sunburn, although we did have a little bit of sunburn from one young lady or two, but uh, no major sunburn uh, and uh, people stayed hydrated and they stayed with the, um, with the sunscreen and uh, covering up and uh, everybody worked. And uh, <clears throat> the, you can see the walls going up, higher and higher. And pretty soon, we're on is this scaffolding. Pretty soon, we're on scaffolding. And you can see how high the walls are now. And the higher they went, the slower they went. What Does it say? I don't know, probably Wednesday. Sure, Wednesday. (laughs) Oh, driving in the DR. (laughs) Um, Those of you that went 12 years ago, the driving wasn't as as intense as it had been 12 years ago, because we were right downtown 12 years ago, and it was was craziness. This was crazy enough. Oh, maybe, maybe that's because we've done it a time or two now. Maybe you should ask these guys if it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, Ashley sat in the front of the, the, the bus a few times and just went, <gasps> <gasps> Oh, no, no. I took one for the team. So I sat in the front. I said, if any accident's going to come, I will know. All right, you guys? Um, there are traffic lights and there are stop signs. They do not abide by any of them. Oh, yeah. It's the biggest guy on the road gets the right away. And there were lots of screams. Like, every single time we left, I wasn't screaming. I was Alina. Alina was the screamer. Uh, I didn't scream. I'm just like, no, this is cool. I like this. Um, We did have to stop a few times. And because I was in the front seat, I could see how close we were to the vehicle we almost hit. And there was a few like one inch clearances. Um, It is just amazing that they can make it all work in that chaos. And we really noticed the difference when we got back to the mainland and got to Miami and we're like, People are following rules and stopping at the lights. This is crazy. Because we had just been doing a whole week of just, it all goes, whatever goes. 
Actually, there are rules that they kind of follow, but they're unwritten. Whoever's there first gets to go through. And the surprising thing is a very, very few, I think, what, two accidents we saw in the whole time that we were there? So And, and no road rage. They use their horns a lot, but it's in a communication way. And we would just always reflect on how our American culture would hate that. We would get very angry. Yeah. But, you know, they made it work. This was our little uh, coaster bus that we were on every day to go back and forth to work and uh, on excursions. And um, I can't believe If you can thing. haul it, why not? Yeah, if you can put a oh, giant yeah, tube yeah. On, your, on your pickup truck, go for it. If you can put 10 people on a moped, no three, or, three or four people on a motorcycle. Yeah. Air conditioners, whatever. Three or four people on a motorcycle is not unusual. Guys hauling um, three or four things of explosive LP gas on a motorcycle is not, uh, not uh, unusual. And, well, this, uh, is, this is one of the toll stations. Um, we had to pass through two of them every single day getting to the job Yeah, site. toll plazas. I think they're for the, to keep the roads up, kept up, but I don't know that there's a lot of evidence of that. This, this, well, one of the sections where we went through a toll was a relatively new road. It was new a couple of years ago when we were first there, and our driver didn't know about it well, and so we would take long ways around until he realized, there's a toll road. You just pay a couple of bucks, and you can get there much faster. Um, but yeah, so that some of the toll roads are nice. Some of them are older and not quite so nice. Okay, I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite things that I saw the whole time. And again, this is me sitting in the front seat, so I get all the action, right? So here in front of us is a trailer with a horse. It's not a covered trailer. This horse is just standing there. It's mane flying in the breeze. And then the next picture is as we're passing the horse, and he's like, here I am. Look at me. Um, having, having a grand old trip. So it was <laughs> just fun, unique things that we got to see on our trip that were not normal in our culture. So we really enjoyed seeing new stuff. We, uh, on our, in the middle of the week, we went to the beach and spent an afternoon and, and evening at the beach. We played in the water, we had pizza, we, had, we played volleyball, sort of. We, um, we met, some, met some people from another mission team that was just up the beach from us. What'd they have? They had like 75 or 80 kids from an orphanage. Yeah. And, and like 35 people that were working with them. And, uh, just just an amazing group of, of young Christians. And they were singing songs that we recognized the tune. They were Christian songs. And we was like, wait a minute, I, I recognize that tune, contemporary Christian music. And then, yeah, we ended up visiting with them for a little bit. Neat folks. I, I can't see all of it. Oh, oh yeah, this was the, this was the big trio at the beach here. Um, just enjoying ourselves. Um, settling all the cares of the world and, and taking an afternoon off and, uh, and enjoying a well-earned rest after working very hard those first four days. As soon, before we even sat down with our, our chairs and table, there were vendors. Uh, and they stayed, they just put their stuff out on the sand and walked away and, and expected you not to steal it. And of course we didn't, but uh, just- And the kids are digging a hole. And then yeah, I added this one in. This is what Stacy does. Like, he's looking for birds. I go so. on mission trips to find birds. <laughs> so here's proof. He was looking for birds. You got one new life list on this trip? Yeah. yeah. And I think he also found a turtle on this trip. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't think I found it. Some, I can't remember who found it. Mike, but we Mike were able found to point the turtle, I think. Yeah. OK, VBS people. So this is VBS. Yes, we would meet right in the classroom. And the other thing is, Especially Ashley as a teacher, you know, we think, oh, our classrooms are so full. Each teacher had at least 40 kids in each classroom. And they were not super big classrooms. But um, yeah, our young people, they pulled double duty. They worked all morning. We'd have lunch. And then right before we'd change, sometimes not change. <laughs> Most of us at least changed our shirt so we didn't show up with concrete everywhere to smear off some of the concrete off our face and then uh, so this was one of the fun things this was a big uh, a popular thing so Ashley in, in her class taught them and we took uh, Alaskan gear so we talked about being prepared uh, the fruit of the spirit helps us be prepared and be like Christ well uh, the go yeah got to talk about talk about that Ashley Hold on, now we're VBS stuff. Um, yeah, so we talked about that. I would get a volunteer to come up, and then I would say, what do we need to be ready for cold weather? And I would 
motion to part of my body and they would reply in Spanish. So then I would dress up the volunteer and then we would take a picture. So the kids thought this was hilarious. So the lady in this picture, she is the principal of the school and at the very, uh, this is the last meeting we have, the administration of the school came up and said, we just wanna thank you and say how much we appreciate what you've done. The kids are going home, they're telling their families all about what they've learned. And I don't know what she said exactly, maybe you know, but she, she goes, I wanna wear all that stuff. So she put it on, she's holding a little native doll and we're taking a picture of her. So she was just over the moon, happy. So I do need to talk about VBS a little bit, okay? We, we, we had all the best laid plans, which is how everything usually starts out, right? All the best laid plans. Cora had all her crafts all ready. Everything was going well. We did a run through. We had an idea of how we were gonna present it, but the humidity hit the cardstock and the cardstock fell flat. So we panicked and tried to come up with plan B. We thought we did well. So day one, day one went great. We were happy, we're like, they we love us, this is amazing. Kids. And they started out with two classrooms. Yeah, just two sessions. Two, two sessions. Can you talk about day two? <laughs> day two. So we had been scrambling every night, you know, we've got the girls around the table, Ashley and I, and Cora cutting out new things, trying to firm up all these crafts. And so we had all prepared. Uh, Cora and I actually had stayed back that, that time. Do we stay back? I think you did. Oh, no, Cora did by herself. Okay, yeah. Yes, Cora did. So we, we get to the school and... Uh, I think for context, there's three adults and we each divide and we each get our own room and then we rotate. So the students are with an adult. So I don't know what's happening in Cora's room. Yeah. Verlin doesn't know what's happening in Cora's room, but we're all late and nothing, we're not rotating on time. Yeah. So I went next door to see how Cora's doing, and she's just like, they're not listening. It's going terrible. The crafts aren't done. I don't know what to do. I'm like, I will find you some helpers. So I grabbed some helpers to run. It was just a little too complicated. Yeah. She's very artsy, and it, it, it wasn't really being, the kids weren't executing it in the way that she envisioned. And it was so. only first and second graders that day. So. And they needed a lot of help for every step of the way. So it went downhill fast, but I think we recovered. <laughs> it's okay, we recovered. And the thing is, from our perspective, we're thinking this has fallen apart, it's a disaster. Um, I ended up leaving all the crafts and the materials with the teachers and said, if you have time in the class, you can finish it. If not, you know, whatever. And they did, they did finish them. And they loved it, they enjoyed it, they thanked us profusely. And you know, in the end, they really didn't notice our mistakes and where we were falling, we felt like we were falling flat. Um, they just appreciated the, the effort and the time that we were spending with them. Exactly, I, I think they appreciated more the fact that you were there. Yeah. It could have been nothing going on, but you were there interacting, and that's what was so wonderful about just seeing the kids. Yeah, good. So on this day, our last day, we were meeting with the fifth and sixth graders, and it kind of started out funny because we came into the courtyard and there was a group of kids that were chanting and it sounded to me like they were saying, no green ghosts, no green ghosts, no green ghosts. I'm going, Verlin, what is going on? Like, this is not the way we want to start. We're thinking that they don't want us there. And Casey, the translator who worked with me mostly, she goes, oh, it's okay. They were saying, los, los green ghosts, los green ghosts. And they were really excited. I'm like, that is not what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> and each, each country is different. So in the Dominican Republic, same, mostly in the Caribbean, uh, uh, Spanish-speaking countries, they use some slang. And so instead of saying, los gringos, they would say, lo gringo, lo gringo. And so it sounded like they were saying, no, <laughs> so I'm thinking we have these punks, fifth and sixth graders, you know. And I'm like, this is our day, huh? Okay. But in reality, they were excited to see you, right? They were right? so yeah. excited and cheery, yes, yes. So at the end of our session, this picture is as the kids were coming downstairs. This is a three-story school building. So they're coming down the stairs, and they see all of our students, and they had to hug them and give them high fives. And I actually took some video. It was very loud. It was so loud how excited they were to see our kids. 
Um, I do have to tell a funny story. Sorry, this is Ashley takeover time. I have to tell a funny story about uh, VBS, and this is about Devin. <laughs> so in my class, my fifth and sixth graders were looking at Devin, and they're like trying to ask me a question. They're pointing to his face. They're asking me this question, and I bring Casey over. I'm like, Casey, what, is, what are they saying? And they're like, they want to know why his chin is so chiseled. Like, why does he have such a great chin? And I just, I, I don't know what to do with that. Like, what? I said, why? Why does that matter? They're like, they think maybe he's Italian. <laughs> OK, so teacher Ashley goes, well, let me tell you about the US. We have a lot of different countries and cultures that come together. We're a melting pot. Anyway, so they got a lot of teacher Ashley on that one. But um, the kids really stepped up, and they did such a great job. And they made connections with the students. So. As the church was literally two small lots next door, the students would dismiss from school and they would come by and we would go, hey, go out to the front and go wave to the kids. So we would wave to the kids and then we invited them to come and we did have several of the kids that came without their parents to church the next church service. So we really built those connections with these kids throughout the week. So it was pretty incredible. What, what she didn't mention was, yeah, a couple of kids came onto the jobs. Friday afternoon, when, when it was all over, the kids just flooded the job site, came in, they wanted to get hugs, they wanted to get pictures, they wanted to exchange numbers, they wanted to do this and that, to the point where Leo, the, the church lady, finally started shouting so she could be heard, not shouting at them, just shouting so she could be heard, and herded them off the job site because we were trying to get cleaned up and get a picture taken and get back for Sabbath and, and so on. But uh, dozens of kids came onto the job site Friday afternoon just, just to say goodbye and, and, uh, and give hugs. And, and it was just wonderful to see the connections that were made. Yeah, we did have kids that went along. It no, was those really, were the only kids that were on the trip. So it was, it was really hard nice. workers. Very hard workers. Can't say enough good stuff about and they did. how they hard were they worked. Awesome workers at the job site, and then could shift gears, and then at VBS they just embraced everything, and and it was them initiating the interaction, the contact with with the local kids, and it was beautiful to see. Mike, he's not here to defend himself, so I can say this: one of the youngest members of our That's group, right and one of the oldest members of our group, um, up here working together. It it didn't matter. You just you just did what what you needed to do. So that was Mike's dad, that's Tom Ralston, so he came with us and then he was working with Devin. So again, the Ralston family was a force to be reckoned with and Tom was woo, building those walls like crazy. I can't, I can't see So that's anything. Andrew, uh, Bermudez, oh, and Olivia. And I took all the pictures, so I stuck myself in there. <laughs> <laughs> You can see how close to the top they're getting. The higher up you get, not only is it more dangerous because you're on scaffolding, but each block has to be cut to fit. Yeah, the edges of this church are 15 courses tall, the, 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 long, the long side, the edges, 15 blocks tall. And then the gable ends, the front and the back, are taller, of course, because you have to meet the point at the top. And did we finish? We finished more than we, ha we have finished yeah. on any project I've been on in the last 25 years. Um, Smallest group, tons the, of work, did the, more than Both gable done. ends were completely up to the top. There's an interior wall that goes clear to the top. And Mike, what were you, about two-thirds of the way? Mike, are you there? Yeah. About two-thirds of the way on that. And then there were restrooms in the back, and they were chest high on the restrooms. About seven, eight courses. I think we did six courses on that, yeah. yeah. So and usually groups come through, and the Maranatha people that were there say that usually these groups come in and they'll, they'll get part of a wall done, you know, part of a wall, but not really finished. And uh, they said that our group was one of the better groups they've seen in a long time, that we actually got the church done and then ran out of time, and so we did interior walls. We had Some, that opportunity. Yeah, we were talking to one of the Maranatha people. They said there was a much larger group from another place in the United States. And I can't tell you where they were because it wouldn't be fair to them. But they worked the same number of days that you did, and they got the exterior walls about two-thirds of the way up, and that's all they could get done. And I'm just thinking, you know, and they said they had a group of about 40, 
And I'm just thinking, what were they doing? But, but you know, and, and then you think about that for a bit. It's not necessarily finishing that's the important thing, right? It's the working. It's the working. It's the experience. It's the bonding. It's the opportunity to work together, learn new things, share with a community, right? And so finishing is a bonus, but uh, sometimes we put a lot of emphasis on getting done. But the emphasis on these mission trips is actually growing people, not necessarily buildings. And so it's fun to, to bond as a group. I think we had a great time as our group, yeah. and we learned a lot about the community. This too. is the interior wall that's going up that we were talking about. And that's how high that wall got. Oh, no, that's the side wall again, near the top. Had to block in for these beautiful windows that, that, are, that are arched windows. They look beautiful when they're done. A lot of little detail. Then at the end, this is a picture we took on Friday afternoon of uh, our group standing in front of the part that we got finished. Keep in mind, this is not the finished product. There will be other groups that will come in. The, the outside will be stuccoed and painted. Um, they wired this so they could put in the DR, so they could put air conditioning in. They're going to put on an insulated roof to hold that air conditioning in, windows as well as bars on the window uh, openings. Um, it, uh, it, it's not finished yet, but it's finished enough so they can use it week by week to worship in. And then this was the, the second Sabbath. Stacy was telling children's story with his interpreter, who I think did a lot more interpreting than she thought she was going to have to. A lot more translating. And this is Leo talking to, who is that? Casey. Is that Casey? Yeah, so Casey, I'd mentioned before, she was standing to the left of the group of, of children that was that first Sabbath. She and Miguel was another young man. I don't know if he's pictured. Um, yeah, uh, they were our main local translators. There's, me, there's Miguel. Job. Yes. Miguel translated for me when I was there in November doing the, um, the pre-site visit. They, they were, is that the last? They were um, certainly helpful people. Now, what are we doing here? Oh, here we go. Um, at the end, they made presentations to each of us of um, a certificate and the kids came up and gave us certificates uh, of uh, participation, as well as um, giving George a plaque in honor of 50 or more Maranatha trips that he's done. That's a lot of trips. It's a lot of trips. And they gave a, um, a shirt to him as well, which the church members signed. And then they gave to our school, they gave us a plaque of appreciation, which will be so don't, placed don't, don't somewhere. Go forward. Just don't go forward past this, because it's a surprise. So keep talking, though, but don't, don't click it yet. <laughs> Ashley. Um, it, uh, it's, um, this will be placed somewhere in the school in a prominent position to, to show our participation and how much La Caleta says. Uh, appreciated us us being there. Ashley uh, took it on behalf of the the school since she was the only full time staff member that we had with us there. Well, and you were there, Stacy. I said full time us. staff member. I, know. I think I wanted to just kind of reflect and offer some takeaways for this trip. Something that really moved me is that we were partnering and coming alongside our brothers and sisters in the Dominican Republic, and we were helping them to create a facility where they could worship. And I just wanted to have that frame of mind where it's like, I, I don't have a lot of skills in building, but I'm here to help, and I want to work with other believers and just really enjoy that relationship. I feel that our teens made some really great connections with the school kids. They made great connections with the um, Maranatha hired construction workers. So Juan was the foreman and they hit it off with Juan and Devin found like a um, cowboy hat, hard hat that Juan 
thinks is the bomb. So I think we're going to try to send him that. But just for us to look at the Christian belief on a global scale and see outside of our little building and go, we're all believers, and to sit and to worship, it was really moving. And I just, I was very skeptical, but I'm a believer now. So I really recommend if you guys ever get that opportunity to, again, worship alongside of um, a believer outside of our church. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing. Do you guys want to add anything before I talk about our surprise? Um, I, I just want to see hands of people who have participated in short-term mission trips somewhere. Just raise your hand if you've participated in a short-term mission trip somewhere, at least one. So you can, you can spread that news to others, too, about how life-changing it is. Um, like Stacy mentioned, it's, we're in the business of, of providing buildings but changing lives. And it, it uh, affected each of us that went in different ways and it affected each of the, the local people that were there when they could see the, the larger global fellowship. Oh, one, one thing, Stacy, I was gonna have you talk about and I, I neglected to do it. La Caleta Six. This is the sixth church of, I think, nine in this one barrio, this one neighborhood on the outskirts of Santo Domingo called La Caleta. That's nine churches in one neighborhood. Yeah, and that's, and that's just in that one neighborhood. So several years ago, the original La Caleta Church, uh, and I don't know exactly when it was, but it has spawned 31 churches. 1992. 1992? 31 separate churches and one school have been the product of that one church. And, and there is a picture I have of, of the family tree of La Caleta and all the different churches that it spawned. And, and La Caleta 6 is the grandchild church of the original one, but it has lots of cousins. So there's, there's a lot of churches being built because they spread the gospel there within their community and they'll outgrow a church and they'll build another one nearby. And then that one will outgrow itself and they'll build another one nearby. And so they, they just spread throughout that region. It's really amazing to see. I mean, I don't know if you want to mention, Casey's been texting you and sending you videos and just what yes. the after the mission trip. Oh, yes. So um, especially Olivia, she really made friends with Casey and her sister, um, Michelle, and uh, they keep in contact. I've been in contact with Miguel as well as Pastor Jose, who was our local pastor contact there. And the kids really connected with him as well. He played basketball with the guys and volleyball with the kids, so that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, they are so excited. Uh, well, we've also extended an invitation to Casey and Miguel to come and be summer camp staff here in Alaska. And so we are working on their visas and their paperwork, and I think they're gonna be here. So they're excited to come and see their friends that they made and, and, and we'll bring them here and visit with you so you, they can see um, the church that partnered with them uh, to build their church. And both of them are young people leaders in their church. They're uh, deacons or elders and um, in their church. Yeah, they're, they're in their mid twenties and they, they assume strong leadership positions. Yeah, so Verlin had received a, a video from Casey and she had her church say, you know, Feliz Sabado and, and send this video message to us. So that's pretty cool. It's, it's fun to have these I connections. About that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's the surprise. Oh, I was going to mention one more thing. Um, hey, we were really blessed not to lose our passports, not to get lost, not to get sick. Jordan was the only one that got super sunburned, but we sent her home right away, and it was fine. And uh, the only person that got kind of sick was Paul because he ate something that looked like French toast, but it was actually cheese, and then that was it for him. So it was all good. We had a great trip. Insects. Should, should we see how French toast looks like cheese? It, I, don't, I wish I had a picture. I know. It's, it's fried. It, fried if you can imagine, cheese wedges. Yes. Yeah. Shaped like a triangle. It looks like French toast. Thick. It was not French toast. It was not tofu either. <laughs> so, okay. Insects. We had some insects at our camp. Day one, I came into my room, and there was a cockroach like this big, and Laura told me to name our fears, and you said, was it Fred? 
Frank. See, now I got it mixed up. Frank. We name our fears. Frank the cockroach lived in my and Jordan's room. I saw him maybe one other time. And then we had another friend that decided to show up in our girls' bathroom. And I know that the kids from AGA know this story. So this friend, um, we went into the bathroom, which is like a dorm setup. It has stalls and, bath and shower stalls in any way. So this, this giant friend appeared, and I got my phone out, and it instantly disappeared. I'm like, what is going on? It's a giant spider, everybody. Like the size of your hand spider. And um, it was mostly here, legs. Here it is. So this is the door in the hallway, and it, I know it's really hard to see the, the relation to how big the spider is. So the problem is, is that it would hide in the stall, and we didn't know where it was or when it would come out. And so this day it came out, and it was in the hallway. So it's in the hallway now. And um, I took my picture, and I skittered down the hallway, and I stood by my door because I was going to like keep my eye on that thing. I don't know if it's a jumper could be a jumper, it could chase me, I don't know. Spiders do that. So I'm standing by my door and, and George Alder comes out of the bathroom and I'm pointing him like, George, there's a spider. And so he goes and he takes a towel and he knocks it down and it falls to the ground and I'm still poised and ready because I'm gonna escape this thing, you know? And so Paul manages to show up at the end of the hallway, sees the spider, comes sprinting down the hallway, has a plate where he traps it. And then they threatened that they were going to put it in Jordan's room. Well, Jordan's my roommate, and we were diagonally across the hallway from Paul and Devin. So they held that thing captive the whole... What she didn't like, say was Jordan has an irrational fear of spiders. I mean, I'm afraid of those things, too. It's like this big, you guys. It's a giant spider. So, so they kept it. They held it hostage. But I have an epilogue to this story. You guys haven't heard this one. Um cleaning out my bedroom a few days ago and my cat has this fascination with ripping things and they ripped up a foam mattress pad that was in my room and it has these chunks black chunks right so I'm picking up all the black chunks and I pick something up and it was a dead spider and it was one of those dead spiders I'm pretty sure and I looked this up and it's a huntsman so apparently it was good for killing cockroaches. But, um, and then I asked Devin, did you put this in my bag? And he said no. So <laughs> he said no, he didn't do it on purpose, but somehow I had a stowaway get in my luggage and it was dead, hallelujah, but oh my word. So the spider, you know, the spider was released unharmed out in the bushes. <laughs> but somehow I had a stowaway. So that was just my, my fun ending to um, our trip. Only a few insects and one giant hand-sized spider. Anyway, we, we would encourage you to uh, participate in a mission trip in the future. And I will tell you about that trip in a moment. But I think every trip we go on, we want to see where God's leading in our lives, right? And how God leads in this trip. And I think there's one story that you probably would benefit from telling about the gift we left the church that so just to prelude just to say god knows what you need before you ask do you believe that god knows what you need before you ask the the first sabbath we were there i preached and i talked about uh, in spanish los tres milagros which means the three miracles which were miracles that occurred on our last mission trip where we had to exit Peru very quickly and unexpectedly. And I said, but this story has a fourth miracle to it. About a week before we left, I got a text from Jessica, who was our Maranatha um, contact, and she said, Rick, I know this is really late, and the church should have asked you about this way before, so if you can't do anything about it, that's fine. But they would love to have a keyboard uh, to help with their services. And I thought, well, when we get down there, we'll ask the participants for some money and we can get a keyboard locally. And I, I said, uh, so I texted her back. I said, we'll see what we can do about it. Well, later that, that very same day, I was walking through the school. I was doing some mission trip, something or other. And leaning up against Ashley's outside doorway was a box about this tall that said keyboard on it, electronic keyboard. 
And so I went in and I said, so Ashley, what's in the box? She said, a keyboard. I'm like, come on, Rick, duh. And I said, well, what's it from or what's it for? She said, well, we're going to use it for morning singing. And it's been in storage for a couple of years. And um, the Corona Church group, when they came up here on one of their mission trips, left it with our school saying, use it however you can. And I said, can we use this for our mission trip? Can we take it? And she said, I don't see why not. So two years ago when Corona was here, they knew that La Caleta Seis was going to need a keyboard, and they left it with us. At least that's what I think happened. Uh, God takes care of stuff before it happens. And this was one of those instances. They were thrilled. They were thrilled to get the keyboard. And Andrew used it for the whole time we were there. I told them we were going to give it to him, but we wanted to use it first. And they said, sure, no problem. And um, we, were, we were happy to give them to that give that to them as a gift from Palmer Seventh-day Adventist Church via Corona Seventh-day Adventist Church. I mean, I drug it up from the music room because I was going to take it to an event in the fellowship room on a Friday, and that event was actually meeting in the church, so I never did use it, so I brought it back to my classroom. I didn't have a chance to take it down, and, and then Rick goes, does it work? I'm like, I don't know, I haven't even opened it yet. And so he opens it and it's brand new. And I, I mean, you, you have to think that God puts these seeds in your head so that you'll do things so that <laughs> when Rick comes to ask for a keyboard, it's sitting in the hallway because God kind of prompted you. So, I, I mean, it's not a coincidence. No, miracle after miracle happens. Um, and uh, if you want to be a part of this, here's how. Yeah, so Laura and I are going to lead another mission trip to the Dominican Republic. Um, it's going to be an open team through Baranoff of Volunteers International, which means that it's open to anybody in the world to join. And so if you want to come, it's going to be February of next year. February, just, we're going to build a church in La Pedra, which is the stone, and it's about four miles north of where we built this church. Is there an age limit on that trip? There is not. So open teams, anybody can come. And uh, if you're willing to work and willing to, to be involved in some way, anybody can come. And so we'd love to invite you, if you're considering mission work, uh, to join us into February next year. You can go on the Maranatha website and look it up or ask me for information. We're going to be going back to the Dominican Republic, same area, meet some of the same people, and build another church for them. Oh, open teams are a lot of fun. I've participated in a couple of them, and we had people from Bermuda, Palm Springs, um, Southern California, Washington State, Minnesota. Um, yeah. they, they come from all over. It's just really amazing. It's a fun opportunity. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move into the closing song, which is number 359, which talks about missions. And the heathen lands explore 
angels if you cannot preach like paul you can tell the love of jesus you can say he died for all if you cannot be the watchman standing high on zion's wall pointing out the path to heaven offering life and peace to all with your prayers and with your bounties you can do what heaven demands you can be like faithful Stand with me, if you could, as we close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to go on trips and learn new lessons, lessons about the importance of keeping our mortar free of rocks and impurities, lessons about growing upwards, lessons about staying close to the string line, and Father, lessons about being patient with other people when we don't quite understand the language. Father, those are things we can learn wherever we are, and we ask that you take those lessons, put them in our hearts so that we can share them with those in this community as well. Keep us close to you. Thank you for knowing what we need before we ask, and we just invite you to be a part of our lives so that we can benefit from that in the community community can benefit from that as well. In your name we pray. Amen.